Good evening. This is CB8 Speaks. I'm Monica McCain Sanchez. This is a monthly program for Community Board 8 of Manhattan, which is defined by the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island. The East Side being defined as 59th to 96th and East River to 5th Avenue. The purpose of this program is to inform residents and others what the Community Board does and what are the important issues in front of the board. Tonight we have the current board chair, Russell Squire, as our guest. Russell's been involved with the community for quite some time and we're really glad he's here. Thanks for being here, Russell. Thank you very much for having me. Can you just tell the viewers a little bit about yourself and your life experience? Sure. So I was born in Manhattan. I've lived here my whole life. I grew up on the Upper East Side. My family moved here when I was five. I went to college at Princeton and then after college I worked on campaigns and in government for a few years. I worked on campaigns here in New York City and also out in other parts of the country, which was a really great experience. And I also worked for the New York State Senate, and that was in 2009 and 2010, and uh, that was a really rewarding experience. And ultimately, I went to law school. I went to Georgetown, and after graduating, you know, I've uh, been working at a law firm here in New York City. Uh, and at the same time, of course, I take a lot of time to be active and involved in my community in a number of different ways. I've done that through the community board, of course. Uh, I've been involved through a local political club in our neighborhood, the Lexington Democratic Club, of which I used to be the president and in which I'm still involved. Uh, I've been involved through my synagogue. It's a, a local synagogue here, Congregation Orzarua, and also in various other ways. And so ultimately, since graduating from law school, my experience, I think, has been similar to a lot of other people on the community board, I, you know, and I, I think very helpful in terms of the fact that it's a balance of community involvement and being very active in community issues. Uh, and at the same time, I think that experience of having a job in the private sector and going to work every day, as most people in our district do, I think that's very valuable as well, because ultimately the people that we serve, our constituents in the community district, most of them work in the private sector and they have jobs and to the extent that they're involved with the community they have to balance that with with that but i think that's uh you know that's really valuable experience in terms of what people are really going through here uh and it's an important perspective to have and and to have with one as uh you know as we're dealing with the various issues that face the community in addition to of course all the actual direct community involvement yeah it's a really hard balance it's the, uh, what I see for people who are on the board, it's really like a full-time job. So, um, you know, thank you for, for stepping up to do even more work. Sure. Um, can you just tell everyone briefly the uh, committees you've been on? Yes. I was the co-chair of the Environment and Sanitation Committee before I became the uh, chair of the board. I'm also on the Street Life Committee. That was the first committee that I ever joined. I was a public member of that even before I became a, a full member of Community Board 8. I'm on the Social Justice Committee, and now that uh, I'm the chair of the Community Board, I also chair the COVID Task Force. Speak a little bit more of anything specific that prepared you to be the chair. So I was the president of the Lexington Democratic Club, a local club in our district, and that's an organization that I led, and so that leadership experience, I think, has been useful. And, you know, anytime you're the leader of a group like this, a community organization that's comprised of volunteers, you have to find a way, first of all, to uh, make sure that everybody's engaged and that uh, people are doing what the, uh, what the organization needs and what the community needs. And at the same time, very often there are different opinions and different uh, constituencies and organizations, and so it's an important thing to be able to balance those and uh, keep everybody happy. Some of the board meetings can be contentious. How do you deal with those difficult discussions or outbursts that you get? So I think the most important thing is civility. That's something that we've really emphasized a lot on Community Board 8, and I think it's something that, by and large, we're pretty good about. You know, everybody on the Community Board is a volunteer, and everybody's there because they're very dedicated to the community. They care deeply about it. And so while there may be differences of opinion, it's very, very important that we are always respectful in the way that we're talking to each other. And I think that that really contributes to a more constructive atmosphere on the board. Beyond that, I think when you're dealing with a contentious issue, it's very important to listen and to hear everybody's perspective. And I think that really helps get 
a sense of where the fault lines really are and what are the things that people actually may largely be in agreement on and what are the real issues that we actually need to work through and try and figure out how to solve and what are some potential solutions to those and I think listening is a really core component of that and then the last thing is leadership it's important to keep everybody focused on the task at hand it's important to make sure that um, ultimately we are driving towards some sort of resolution of the issue or some sort of action uh, where it's something that we need to act on and you know, very often there are issues that may require a nudge from uh, the chair, you know, or I think that that's appropriate if I think it, for whatever reason, it really should uh, come out a certain way if I have a, a strong view about that. So I think all of those things together have allowed us to get through some tough issues in what has been a very, very busy year for the community board. It really seems like in their last year in office, a number of, uh, you know, from our mayor on down, there have been a lot of issues coming from the city that we've had to address, a lot of big issues. And so it's been a very, very busy year for us, and I think we've managed to get through it pretty well. So generally, what are the duties as the chair that you have? So the chair is responsible first and foremost for leading the board, and that means chairing the full board committee meetings and uh, doing all that that entails in terms of keeping the agenda moving and all of that. In addition, the chair is responsible for appointing leaders of the different committees. And so there it's important to have an understanding of what the different committees are doing and different people's strengths and leadership styles and making sure that the committees are running well and, and getting things done and operating smoothly. The chair of the community board also supervises the community board staff. So we have a staff that supports the community board and ultimately they're answerable to the chair and so that's a part of the job, the job there. In addition, the chair is really the face of the board in a lot of ways. And so that involves liaising with our elected officials, various community organizations, community groups, other community stakeholders, and dealing with the press at times where that's needed and really making sure that the needs and views and concerns of the community are being expressed to our city agencies and to our elected officials and working with them to help the community. So it's a very multifaceted role that involves a lot of different things. Yes. It's not just chairing those meetings. There's a lot behind the scenes, too. That's right. Yeah. You mentioned the, the staff. So uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that. Now, the board's made up of volunteers, the ones that, you know, people know about the community board are volunteers. But you have a staff, and they are paid, and they are employees of the city. Can you tell us uh, generally the positions they have and what they can do to help the public? Sure. So we do. We have a fantastic staff. It's led by a district manager. Our district manager is Will Brightbill. Uh, and our assistant district manager is Saida Harrigan. We've also got uh, community associates currently. Well, ordinarily we would have community associates and community assistants. Right now we have a part-time community assistant, Murat, and we've also got some interns. So the work of the staff is extremely important. They support the board in a number of ways. They do constituent work. Uh, very often people will call the board with concerns and it's the staff that's involved in resolving those and helping those folks in the first instance with their problems. The staff helps a lot with the administrative support of the meetings. So sometimes in terms of outreach to city agencies or others for scheduling when we have guest speakers or other people coming to committee meetings that's all arranged typically by the staff maybe some initial outreach may have been done by a committee chair or by myself but the staff often handles the uh, details there in addition the staff 
is involved in the preparation work that goes into the meetings. So the staff helps compile, well, back when meetings were in person. What the staff would do is, of course, they would have to print out all of the agendas, do all of that sort of work, get everything that was necessary to get to the meetings. You know, when it comes to full board meetings, we have our tablets that have the agendas and all the meeting materials on them, and the staff prepares all of that. Since COVID, when things went remote, the job changed, but it's been no less intense because the staff still has to compile the various materials that we may need. And so for committees like Street Life Committee or the Landmarks Committee, where we're dealing with applications, they're the ones who get all that information and make sure that it's uh, accessible for the members. But also Zoom has required enormous amounts of time from our staff to help run the Zoom meetings that we have. And our board's very active. We have committee meetings almost every weeknight. And so that's taken up a lot of staff time to run those meetings and make sure that they go smoothly and make sure that uh, everything is operating well during those meetings. They're also managing the website too, aren't they? That's right. So yes, we have a great website. They handle that. There's also some social media that we do and, and they handle that as well. That's terrific. You did mention about remote meetings and the July meeting was the first one we'd had in person for a year and a half, which was pretty unique, a really neat outdoor venue, it allowed us to be socially distanced. But of course, we can't do that in the winter and now there's a new virus circulating around. Do you think we're going to be able to continue the outdoor meetings or we have to go back to Zoom? So for the time being, I think we can continue to have outdoor meetings for the full board meetings. You know, all of this arose. Initially, obviously, during COVID, we were able to do hybrid meetings because the open meeting law was suspended. But ordinarily, what people should understand is New York State has something called the open meetings law, and that requires meetings like ours at the community board to be held in person. That was suspended for COVID. That allowed us to do the Zoom meetings that we've done, I think, very successfully since that began. The suspension of the open meetings law ended in, uh, it was either at the end of June or the beginning of July. So that has presented a real challenge for the community board because while there at that time had been some improvement in the COVID situation, a lot of people were still concerned about getting back together and being in person and having gatherings of that nature. So we had, what we have done is, I've said that committee meetings can continue to take place over Zoom. Our full board meetings, whether it's of the Land Use Committee, which is a committee of the full board, or our regular full board meetings are gonna be done in person because that's really what's necessary under the law. And so we were able to do it outdoors, as you mentioned, in July, and that was a really successful meeting. People were very excited, I think, to see each other once again, and we had a great space, and really we have to, uh, I have to thank Hunter College once again for allowing us to use space. We used the courtyard at the high school there between 94th and 95th, and I think that worked very successfully. Now, as you've said, there may be challenges with weather uh, in the future, and of course, as the weather gets colder, it won't be possible to do that. I think the cold weather is far enough in the future that we'll cross that bridge when we get to it and hopefully COVID will have improved by then. We've been making rain plans essentially if, uh, you know, if it does happen that uh, we can't be outdoors for weather related reasons, you know, we'll probably either postpone the meeting or find uh, a location indoors uh, that's an alternative rain location where people are able to be socially distanced. COVID continues to be a challenge and it's something that we have to try to adapt to. And so I've tried to do it in a way that's as safe as possible for everybody. Uh, speaking of the committees, um, there are many, many committees and they certainly change as social needs change. And the last time uh, we spoke when you appeared on this program, when you were running for the position, um, you at that point said you didn't think um, committees needed changing, you wanted to focus more on task force. Uh, based on your experience as chair for the past eight months, are you still holding that position or have you changed um, your thinking about that? My view is still the same. I still think, um, I don't think we need changes to our standing committees. I think we have 
a good array of committees uh, touching on the various different issues that face the community board. In terms of task forces, I think to have ad hoc task forces that can address particular issues that are temporary, I think that's a very important thing to do and that's a useful tool. And that's actually something that we've done in the course of the last uh, year. I guess it's been less than a year since I've been chair, but uh, you know, over the course of 2021, we actually had one of the uh, major initiatives that came out of city government this year is the council had a proposal called Planning Together for Comprehensive City Planning. Of course, this was a very, very big bill, very sweeping proposal that would have led to major changes in the city. And it was something where I felt it was going to take more than just one land use committee meeting to look at it because the bill was fairly detailed, fairly intricate. You know, there was a lot going on there and I think it was just going to take more time for us to look at it than we were really going to be able to do in a land use committee of the whole board. So I created a task force on that Planning Together initiative and the task force met a number of times and made some recommendations and really went into the nitty gritty details of the bill and ultimately crafted a resolution and came back to the full board and we had a discussion of that and, and uh, the resolution passed. So I think for situations like that, task forces are very effective. Uh, but in terms of the standing committees, I think we have the committees that we need and we think we have a good mix. Now, what are the big issues the community board is concerned about, either short or long term? Some of the things you've mentioned before are affordable housing, schools, park space, and has other things come to light in this experience as the chair? So the top three issues in our district needs statement every year, and I imagine that'll be the same this year, although we'll see. Uh, it is, as you mentioned, it's affordable housing, it's schools, and it's open space. And those continue to be very, very important priorities for us. You know, uh, when it comes to affordable housing, that's something that our community board has been calling for for years now. And we really do want to see more affordable housing in our district. Our district has seen uh, quite a bit of residential construction. And unfortunately, it has not been enough to offset the affordable housing that we have lost. Uh, you know, the, the, by and large, the residential construction that we've seen has been market rate housing or, or luxury housing. It hasn't really involved affordable housing. We need to find a way to sustain and replace the affordable housing that we have in our district and frankly, add more affordable housing. Unfortunately, over the last few years, on net, we've actually lost affordable housing in our district, despite the fact that we have had residential construction and a lot of new um, housing being built. And so I think that's a sign that currently what the city and the state are doing isn't working, that really more needs to be done to make sure that we are bringing affordable housing to this district. It's something that's a big priority in our Housing Committee has been looking very, very hard at this this year and working to try and come up with proposals and things that we can do and try and get advanced at the state level and also at the city level to try and promote more affordable housing here in the district. In addition, open space is a very important issue for us. There are parts of our district that really are starved for open space, that are very far from any kinds of parks and open space. And so we're always pushing for more open space and to preserve our open space that we have. And of course, school seats are critical as well. You know, school overcrowding is a huge issue throughout the city. Everyone wants to reduce overcrowding in the schools and the way to do that is to have more schools and more school seats. And so we've called for that as well. You know, there are other major issues, of course, confronting our community board and our community district. One of them is the New York Blood Center proposal that we've been dealing with. This is a proposal to redevelop the current site where the New York Blood Center is on 67th Street and build a massive new commercial tower there and rezone that space. And that's something that the community board and the community more broadly have been very, very concerned about. So that proposal has gone through the Euler process. It's still in the Euler process. The first phase of that was community board review after uh, you know, certification by city planning. We looked at that, um, we had 60 days to do that, and we did and, and passed a very comprehensive resolution. 
in opposition to that proposal. The borough president has looked at that and she recommended opposition and, and uh, disapproval of that proposal. And it's currently with the city planning commission and ultimately it will go to the council. And so we've been very, very active as a community board in fighting this and making sure that the city planning commission currently and ultimately that the council uh, understand what our concerns are and understand what the issues are. I mean, I was just speaking about open space. This proposal poses a real danger to St. Catharines Park and will cause shade that will completely transform the park in a negative way that we just can't accept and it will cast shadows on the school across the street, the Julie Richmond Education Complex, which is a wonderful facility that houses a number of schools with students from all over the city. And there's also a component of this that relates to zoning, of course. And you know, a big part of what the community board does is land use and zoning. And it's something that not everybody's familiar with, but it's really a very, very important part of quality of life in the city and the way that the city operates and sometimes it's a little bit under the radar for people who aren't as familiar with it but for the community board it's very very important to what we do and it's a big part of the types of things that we look at that blood center space is in a district a type of district called an r8b district which is a mid-block district that preserves neighborhood character quality of life it makes sure that on the middle of the blocks we have lower density and that's something that's very very important to the community and what's being proposed is a rezoning of r8b districts and if you go back to the history of r8b where it's something that communities all over manhattan really pushed hard to get and were successful at it's a great success story in city zoning and we just can't undo that and it would really be tragic to undermine that and I think we'd set a dangerous precedent for other areas where there are R8B districts. So all of these are big issues and big concerns that we have with this proposal. And so we're fighting very hard to make sure that the proposal that they put before us doesn't go through. We support the mission of the Blood Center. And you know what we've pointed out a number of times is that they can expand their space to fully meet the programmatic needs that they've discussed within the current zoning of the building. And so we're hoping that that's ultimately what they decide to do and don't add on this uh, ancillary and unnecessary commercial space. So that's another major issue that we're dealing with. Another thing that unfortunately is of course a major issue is COVID. COVID-19 is, is of course far from over and things were really improving as the uh, you know vaccination was rolled out and many people got the vaccines and things were really starting to come back and unfortunately now things are trending in a different direction and of course that's really due to the fact that some people have stubbornly refused to get vaccinated so that's a very frustrating thing to see uh, some of that progress being rolled back people were very very excited to be getting out again people were very excited again we had our in-person meeting to be able to see one another again in person and I'm hopeful that the mandates that are being put in place, I think that's long overdue. I, I think that that's going to have a big impact, hopefully, very positively in changing and making sure that we're back on the right track in terms of getting COVID under control. But until that happens, we've still got all the challenges that we've been dealing with before. So all the challenges related to schools. And on the one hand, of course, it's really important for kids to be in school and learning in class and that's really a much better way to learn than having to do it over zoom and through remote learning but all of those challenges that we've had around schools are still there and how to deal with that unfortunately has not uh, abated and and that's of course coming up very soon as the fall approaches and of course the impact that it's had on small businesses and small businesses have really really struggled through COVID and small businesses are such an important part of what makes our neighborhoods and community board aid what they are and an important part of the quality of life and small businesses have really struggled and you know it was great when we were coming back out and I think it was uh, you know things were trending in the right direction but now that things um, have gotten bad again or, or starting to get a little worse it's once again posing this challenge for small businesses. Uh, another big issue in our district is homelessness. You know, we've seen increasing numbers of homeless people on the streets and 
know, frankly, more needs to be done to get people the help that they need to get them off the street. And the reality is that the city spends a lot of money on homelessness and, and dealing with this problem. And unfortunately, it has not led to a reduction in homelessness. And we're still seeing a lot of homeless folks on the street. And so I think there really need to be changes in the way that the city does that and smarter and more effective ways of spending that are going to actually make sure that we are able to provide the services that we need and do what, what it needs to be done to actually get homeless folks off the street. And then another issue is crime. This, unfortunately, we have seen the crime statistics go up in a number of areas and there is an increasing perception uh, among people in the community that, uh, that crime is increasing and people are very concerned about that. And that also, that's a really important quality of life issue because people want to know that their streets are safe. They want to feel safe and secure in the community. And it's very, very important that even though in a sort of historical sense, the crime numbers are still low, you know, anytime you have a trend going in the wrong direction, that's a cause for concern. And, and, and you know, people are entitled to feel that their city is safe and, and they want to feel secure and, and make sure that they're going to have safe streets. So that's a whole host of issues, and there's others, but there's really a lot uh, for us to deal with. Yes, there are. I mean, the community board meetings have such intense agendas. Um, and again, going to the website, people can see what the upcoming committee meetings are, the topics they're going to be discussing, then what's coming before the full board. We'd like to talk a little bit about Roosevelt Island, part of our community district, really different from the Upper East Side. So what are the key issues that Roosevelt Island faces? So one of the biggest issues is the lack of a bank branch right now. There had been one in-person full bank branch on Roosevelt Island that closed uh, last year, and so now there is no full-service bank branch on Roosevelt Island, and that's a huge problem. And it's a big problem because a number of the people on Roosevelt Island are seniors, and they really need access to that sort of traditional full-service banking, and they're not going to be able to do everything remotely. And frankly, everybody on Roosevelt Island should have access to that full-service banking and having an in-person branch there and not having to go take the tram into Manhattan just to be able to speak to your bankers. That's been a real priority. It's something that the borough president has been working hard on and other elected officials. And another important issue on Roosevelt Island and something that I've dealt a lot with is the Kohler Task Force. So I am the chair of the Kohler Task Force as the chair of the community board. The Kohler Task Force is it's comprised of representatives from the community board, representatives from elected officials who represent Roosevelt Island at the state, city, and federal level. It's comprised of residents of Kohler Hospital, which is a skilled nursing facility on Roosevelt Island that's run by the city. And it's also got members from various different community groups and advocacy groups. And the Kohler Task Force really dates to last year. At this point, we're all familiar with the crisis that hit nursing homes as a result of COVID and the tragedy that resulted from that and how awful that was. And while that was going on in the midst of that, you know, Kohler was uh, particularly hard hit. And, you know, Kohler, in addition to having the challenges that many nursing homes faced with residents there being afflicted with COVID and particularly susceptible to it, there were a number of COVID patients that the city decided to move to Kohler. And, you know, we now know, and I think we should have known then, but it's certainly become clear now that it basically brought COVID into a vulnerable population and, uh, you know, ultimately led to terrible consequences and, and deaths. And while this was going on, the residents of Kohler were crying out for help and pointing out that this was going on and that it wasn't getting any attention. And so the Kohler Task Force was formed to address that issue and make sure that the residents' concerns were going to be met and make sure that, this, um, that we weren't going to have COVID patients uh, housed with 
nursing home residents anymore and to solve those problems. That's That was the genesis of it, but the residents of Kohler have faced a number of COVID-related issues as well. You know, part of the problem is that there was a sort of reaction to the problem that happened in the nursing homes with all of the, you know, unnecessary death and and the tragedy that happened there. And I think what happened ultimately was that the state, even as things were opening up, the state moved too far in the other direction. And so while other parts of, you know, life were opening up and the rest of us were able to start doing outdoor dining and we were getting back together in person in a limited way, the restrictions on nursing homes continued to be extremely onerous. And it really wasn't possible for residents of nursing homes, this is to take one example of one issue, to have in-person visitation until just a few months ago. And so you can imagine over a year of essentially isolation and the lack of in-person visitation for these residents was really, really very difficult. And that's something that's uh, very, very important work because of course, you know, uh, everybody in the community district, they're all our constituents. And so we wanna make sure that the residents of Kohler are getting what they need and able to overcome the various challenges that they've had to deal with. So that's really what the Kohler Task Force has been about. Thank you very much for being here. We've come to the end of the program, and uh, you've been extremely informative. I really appreciate your, your coming, and I want to thank everyone for watching. And if you want to get involved with the community board, again, visit the website cbaam.com, and you can see when the committee meetings are coming up. Some are remote. Some may be in person, I'm not sure. If you can join them and, and hear what's going on, I think you'll really appreciate the work that everyone is doing. It'd be great if you got involved too. So thank you again and see you in the future. Well, great. That was a fun interview. Really, you have really outstanding answers, especially right, okay. the core and bringing in the blood center and the.